Canada, where a world record may be broken this weekend as a massive convoy of truckers travel from the west coast city of Vancouver all the way to the capital, Ottawa. Uh, now, <laughs> the reason, well, let's just say it's not entirely aimed at breaking a world record, but is actually part of a growing protest against the Canadian government's vaccine mandates. Organizers of the convoy say they want Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to drop any vaccine mandates required for truckers who cross the Canada-US border. Remember, this is a really vital transit route for goods. They also want Trudeau to scrap other COVID-related health protections. Hundreds of trucks joined by thousands of protesters blocked the streets of the Canadian capital, Ottawa, on Saturday to protest against the government's coronavirus vaccine policies. The demonstration originated last week on the other side of the country when a convoy of trucks set out from Vancouver. During the more than 4,000 kilometer journey to Ottawa, the convoy was... Ottawa has a new soundtrack. As protesters move to surround the parliament, a movement spurred on by truckers makes itself heard. As the signs make clear, this is a reaction to COVID restrictions, mainly because Canada and the U.S. now say if a trucker wants to cross the nearly 9,000 kilometer long border, they have to be vaccinated. The Canadian transport minister joined Al Jazeera to defend the policy. We have mandated uh, vaccination, vaccination for transportation sector, for the airline sector, for marine sector, for the rail sector last fall. And we've done it successfully. So now almost 99% of workers in those sectors are fully vaccinated. That has reduced infection rate, that has re reduced hospitalization, that's reduced absenteeism, and that added resilience to our supply chain. There are reports that Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his family were moved to a secure location out of concern. And the police chief said, he felt he needed to bring in extra officers. The risk factors extend beyond the core demonstrators to those that have already indicated um, online and in, in other forums that they're prepared to engage directly or indirectly with the events that will transpire over the next several days here. And some of them have been very clear in inciting hate, um, encouraging acts of violence and criminality. There were no reports of violence early Saturday, but there was plenty of profanity lay signs and strong opinions expressed. I understand the pandemic is a problem. However, we're going to look around us and see also what we're doing when we're implementing all these, these mandates. You know, we cannot, we cannot kill the patient in the name of curing them. We cannot do that, guys. So we're going to stand free. That's what we're going to do. The question now, when will this stop? It's a well-funded protest raising more than $8 million on GoFundMe, meaning this may be the sound of the city for a while to come.
Why are you on Parliament Hill? Why wouldn't I be? This is democracy. This is what democracy is all about. People believe that the government has overstepped with mandates and they are here to exercise their democratic right. We give, people give the government the power to act in accordance with their values. The, gov does not, the government does not have any independent power. It is us that confer the power on the government. And where they overstep, the people have a right to voice their opinions. What we've seen in the last year with demonization of people, turning people against each other, the hatred that has been spewed from the highest levels is completely unacceptable. And the people have had enough. And so they're here to voice their opinions. And I support any peaceful uh, act of democracy. And all I've seen here is loving, law-abiding Canadians expressing their voice, which they're entitled to do. So why wouldn't I be here, Andrew? Do you feel like the Conservatives have done an adequate job at representing these people throughout the pandemic in the last couple of years, or even in the time that you've been in office the last few months? Well, I've always spoken out. You've seen that I've always spoken out from the very beginning about things that concerned my constituents. I will always be a voice for my constituents, and I will never be silent. So I believe that that MPs have said and acted in accordance with the voices of their constituents, yes. For a lot of people, this is not about whether you're pro or anti-vaccination. It's about a more fundamental message, which is about government overreach. Is that resonating with what you're hearing from your constituents on the ground? Absolutely. There are, whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, it's about the mandates and whether or not these mandates are fair, whether they... Um, they adhere to a public health principle because that's what we're concerned about. We want everybody to be safe. We want people who are able to be vaccinated to ex exercise informed consent. That's what, that's what we're concerned about. So it's not about whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated. It's about government overreach.
nowhere fast. Thousands of trucks are stranded in Argentina as the drivers wait to be tested for COVID-19 to enter Chile. And the wait is taking its toll. I've been here for two weeks. I've got a refrigeration unit, but not enough gas to run the fridge. Many of these trucks are carrying refrigerated goods, with the engine having to stay running to keep the products from spoiling. Diesel is running out, and they have equipment that cannot handle being on for a long time. The engines are running all day and night, and they're starting to fail and affect the cargo. When we get to Chile, we'll have to come back because of this. It's all stopped going in and going out. With nowhere to go, the drivers rely on sharing food to eat and use makeshift toilets and showers. We go into the city, buy a few things and split them among ourselves. People nearby give us a little bit of food, whatever they can to do to help, even if it's a little. Right now we have a bathroom and a shower that they sent for us, but we have to pay for it. A similar problem has been affecting drivers on the northern border of Chile, where they also face long queues. This is becoming a real problem. The authorities or the presidents have to take care of this. Row after row, these truck drivers are forced to wait in close quarters during a pandemic for a test they need to finish their job. Leah Harding, Al Jazeera. This is no man's land between Ukrainian government forces and separatist fighters with the self-declared Donetsk People's Republic. The Russian-backed authorities in Donetsk have given us rare access to the territory they control for the first time since 2017. The city seems more Russian than when we were last here, on the surface at least. The statue of Lenin still stands proud over the main square next to a Russian flag. But there are also vast pro-Russia murals on buildings. This one reads Russian Donbass. A heart in the colors of the Russian flag sits in the snow-covered park. Destruction from eight years of conflict is worse near what used to be Donetsk airport. This was where some of the heaviest fighting took place between pro-Russia separatists and the Ukrainian government forces when conflict started in 2014. Nikolai says he and many people like him see little chance of a future with the Ukrainian government wanting closer ties with Europe and NATO. Russia will help. Putin warned the West don't dare to put a foot in this region. There is no future with Ukraine unless it changes. Some residents, like Vladimir, occasionally come to try and repair their homes. We are between a rock and a hard place. There are no jobs. We are doing our best to survive. Many people say they don't want to go back to Ukraine after what's happened. Either people want independence or to join Russia. Most of the people that used to live in this neighborhood are too afraid to return because of the sporadic shelling and now increasing fears of a potential renewed conflict. But there is a side to life in Donetsk that perhaps reflects a determination to live a normal life, especially amongst a young generation, many of whom were children when the conflict started. Many young people have left for Russia or elsewhere in search of jobs. Nightclubs like this one are only open at weekends and have to close when the curfew starts at 10 p.m. We are separated from the rest of the world. For example, we cannot use international payment systems and it's difficult to get in and out. I travel to Dubai and Europe, but those that can't afford to go out, they just stagnate here. No matter what happens here, young people are trying to find joy in life. We try our best to live like people do in the rest of the world. Russia has always denied supporting the separatists militarily saying the conflict is an internal matter for the Ukrainian government and their opponents to solve. But Russia's influence here seems stronger than ever. Something people say the Ukrainian government and their international backers always fail to understand. Charles Stratford, Al Jazeera, Donetsk. Another sign of how serious the U.S. thinks the threat Russia poses to Ukraine the U.S. president announced he's moving U.S. forces to the region. Have you decided how soon you would be moving U.S. troops to Eastern Europe? I'll be moving U.S. troops to Eastern Europe and the NATO countries in the near term. 
not a lot. He's likely talking about the 8,500 troops that were put on standby to deploy, most headed to bolster NATO's quick reaction force. But he's also said he has no intention of sending U.S. troops to Ukraine. And a new tone from the Pentagon. With more than 100,000 Russian troops on Ukraine's border, the top military leaders say Russia has enough force to take over Ukraine. Given the type of forces that are arrayed, uh, the ground maneuver forces, the artillery, the ballistic missiles, the air forces, uh, all of it packaged together, if that was unleashed on Ukraine, it would be significant, very significant, and it would result in a significant amount of casualties, uh, and, and you can imagine what that might look like in dense urban areas, uh, along roads and so on and so forth. It would be horrific. It would be terrible. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is trying to reassure his people, saying we've seen Russian build up forces like this before. The warning from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff this time is different. And the Biden administration is under pressure by some to have the military do more, issue sanctions, and then escalate. Well, the signal I want to send is we're not going to back off. The more provocative you are, the more resil resolve we'll have for NATO. So send American and NATO soldiers around Russia to reinforce we're not giving an inch when it comes to NATO. But the administration wants to send the message diplomacy can still work. There's no reason that this situation has to devolve into conflict. He can choose to de-escalate. He can order his troops away. He can choose dialogue and diplomacy. If not, the U.S. says the results will be catastrophic, not just for Ukraine, but for Russia as well. Patty Colhane, Al Jazeera, Washington. Russia's naval strength on full display in the Black Sea. Part of regular drills it carries out throughout the year. And in the country's southwest, more troops and military hardware are taking part in live fire exercises. But Russia has dismissed U.S. warnings it is about to invade Ukraine. There won't be a war as far as it depends on the Russian Federation. We don't want a war, but we won't let our interests be rudely trampled on and ignored. The U.S. has rejected all the Russian security proposals for the last two or three years. Now they're putting the same things on the table. In other words, they're borrowing from recent Russian initiatives. This is something, at least. One of Moscow's strongest allies and a neighbor to the north has reiterated its support for Russia and says that the two countries are only interested in self-defense. So will there be a war or not? Yes, there will be. But only in two cases. If direct aggression is committed against Belarus, if a hot war is unleashed against our Belarus, and the second possibility of war to happen, and for Belarus to take part in it, is for our ally, the Russian Federation, is directly attacked. If the same aggression is committed against the territory of the Russian Federation. Russia and Belarus are due to begin 10 days of joint military exercises next month, the biggest ever held. But on the streets of Moscow, people say it's Russia that's being provoked. I believe America wants to provoke Russia by any means. We live decently now in Russia. I'm 70 years old, and I can say we have never lived better than now. They feel threatened by this and are trying to destabilize us. It all smells of provocations. Half of the people I know are Ukrainian. I can't believe there will be war. I can't believe it. It's the conflict of politicians rather than ordinary people. Ukrainians are our relatives. Russia never attack anyone, and it's never going to. We only defend. It's the United States who escalate in the whole situation because it's profitable for them. President Vladimir Putin has spoken to his French counterpart Emmanuel Macron about Russia's deep unease with NATO's eastward expansion. So the diplomatic window is still open to avert what could be a disastrous conflict for all sides. Dorsa Jabari, Al Jazeera, Moscow. Once complete in the summer, Poland's wall will be 186 kilometers long, almost half the length of the borderline with Belarus. 
Will it stop almost daily attempts by refugees and migrants to make the illegal crossing? Probably not, according to a Kurdish immigration lawyer who spoke to Al Jazeera, especially if, as is widely alleged, they continue to get help from Belarusian border guards. Actually, I think that the wall is not is not useful. We know that uh, migrants can find another way, and uh, maybe, as you know, as I told you, that Bolivarians and Guardes help them to cross the border, and of course, they find another place. Ragaz put us in touch with Nizar, a Kurdish refugee who, with his family, including young children, is among hundreds living in a warehouse on the Belarusian side. I asked Nizar if he was aware that Poland is building a wall to keep people like him out. What can we do? We have to wait. We can't go back to our country. We're not part of the political problem between Belarus and Poland. We just want to cross the border and get to safety in the European Union. It's a familiar story told by desperate people fleeing circumstances they can no longer tolerate. There may be among them purely economic migrants as well, but Poland makes little distinction, putting hundreds into asylum detention camps and simply pushing others back. The crisis that flared last autumn is now much reduced. Thousands were allegedly lured to the Belarus border on the false promise of an easy crossing. It was both a cynical attempt by Belarus to destabilize parts of the EU and also a political opportunity for the Polish government. Poland's wall being built at vast expense and partly through forests that are a UNESCO protected World Heritage Site is a pretty extraordinary answer to what is now a fairly minimal problem. Is it worth it to stop small numbers of people trying to cross the border from Belarus? Well, it is if you're a right-wing populist government. State-run TV news bulletins report the broadly popular claim that Poland is doing its bit to protect the external borders of the EU from uncontrolled migration. Public opposition to the government's policies does exist. We just would like to, uh, to let people know that maybe not everyone in Poland is against people coming here from other parts of the world and we are still here for them. But their voices are barely heard. Jonah Hull, Al Jazeera, in eastern Poland. Colette Nyakupuka is frustrated as she leaves Zimbabwe's largest public hospital. She says she's been sick for months and still doesn't know what's wrong with her. I was told I can't get blood tests done because the labs are not working. I now have to go to a private laboratory, but they're too expensive, so I haven't got any help yet. Public health workers here often complain about low wages, the lack of personal protective equipment, shortages of drugs and medical equipment, as well as poor working conditions. In some of the medical awards you can have uh, two nurses, nursing 40 patients, nursing 30 patients, which is, uh, which is not the correct uh, patient, nurse patient ratio. And uh, this will lead to burnout uh, of the nurses. So the nurses that are in the hospital right now, they, they are tired, uh, they have got a burnout and uh, they, 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 they wish also to leave. And uh, what is going to happen tomorrow uh, as far as our health delivery system is concerned? The government's health service board says last year more than 2,000 health professionals left Zimbabwe to take jobs in the UK, Ireland, Australia and the US. That's more than double the number of doctors, nurses and pharmacists who left in 2020 and three times the number of resignations in 2019. Zimbabwe's government says it costs $70,000 a year to train just one doctor and it takes years before they qualify. As developing countries we are spending a lot of scarce resources, yeah, we call them scarce resources, in training our health workers and only to lose them to developed countries. And so it is very ideal if such support could be given in terms of monetary investment or material resources. The COVID-19 pandemic has made wealthy nations intensify recruitment and relax visa restrictions for health workers from poorer nations. An average worker in the public sector takes home less than $200 a month. In the UK, for example, they can earn 10 times as much. Despite repeated promises from the government to improve salaries, they remain low.
The continued loss of trained health professionals is worsening Zimbabwe's already overstretched public health system. And right now, there seems to be little incentive to make staff stay. Haru Mutasa, Al Jazeera, Harare. High inflation is a major talking point for all Turks. The lira has lost nearly half of its value within the past year, as the central bank made steep cuts to interest rates. That unorthodox policy caused prices to soar, including for energy and food, such as the ingredients for a Turkish breakfast. To make one kilo of this kosher cheese, you need 11 liters of raw milk. The price of milk doubled, with the increase on electricity, natural gas prices are rising. Our regular customers cut their consumption nearly 40%. Turkey's inflation rate rocketed to 36 percent in December after a series of interest rate cuts demanded by President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. It's the highest inflation rate since his election 20 years ago. We used to buy in kilos last year, now in grams. More than half of our retirement salaries are being spent on gas, electricity, phone bills on the first day. High prices are likely to remain a focus of stock market attention. The central bank is desperately seeking to rebuild foreign reserves, which fell more than 60 percent from mid-December to just $7.5 billion. Fears of further inflation rises in the coming months terrify Turks. Many say the latest increase to the minimum wage and the pensions are not enough to make ends meet. The central bank forecasts an inflation rate of 23 percent this year. Some analysts think that's optimistic and expect worse to come. We manage somehow. We buy the cheapest things, but it's very difficult for larger families to manage. I don't know how things will work. Responding to the economic challenges, government leaders in Ankara have implemented a series of measures during the past month to persuade savers, banks and companies to hold more lira rather than foreign currency. Those measures studied the lira for now, but many fear their hopes of lower inflation have already left the station and they'll soon be paying an even bigger price for Turkey's financial turmoil. Sinam Kosolo, Al Jazeera, Istanbul. Marikaba is on her daily commute to the local market to buy food for her family's dinner. She haggles, but the vendors refuse to budge. So the mother of six has to settle for what she can afford. A few onions, pepper, some rice and oil. Let me family and all go cook almost pop I can't afford to feed my family like I used to. Previously, I cooked eight to ten cups of rice for the family to eat well. Not anymore. No one eats properly these days. We eat just a little. She says prices have tripled and there is no sign of any reduction. Sierra Leone's economy suffers from financial instability and mismanagement, exchange rate fluctuations and corruption. All that in addition to disruptions caused by three major disasters. When COVID-19 began, Sierra Leone's economy was already struggling with the effects of a civil war and the Ebola virus. Those disasters devastated production, especially agriculture. And with rising poverty levels, many families here say they can hardly afford two meals a day. Despite huge natural resources, one of the country's biggest challenges is how to grow its own food. The reliance on food imports is expected to continue for the foreseeable future. Sierra Leone imports everything, you know, so there is that high demand for foreign exchange, you know. And when the demand for somebody's property is higher than yours, then the price goes up, you know. There is a simple saying, whenever the buyer is more anxious than the seller, the price will never come down. The manufacturing sector hit hard by the civil war, Ebola and COVID-19 is slowly coming back to life. But growth is stunted just as the local currency, the Lyon, continues to weaken against major currencies. It is a very difficult situation at the moment, uh, especially when the raw material prices have increased so much. Costs for manufacturers have also risen so sharply that production has decreased. As prices rise, Customers like Marikaba are suffering the effects. Ahmed Idris, Al Jazeera, 
Freetown, Sierra Leone.